Hi there, and welcome to Footyology, the show that doesn't duck under the big issues, drop at the knees when it comes to controversy, or even wait for the umpire's whistle when there's an easy target in the way and a free kicking to be had. I'm Rowan Connolly, with me is my co-host Mark Fine, and together we're going to go headfirst into the contests of a big round 10 of AFL action. Fend off any tacklers with a Dusty Martin-esque don't argue, and slam home the match winner from outside 50, or in our case, the wrong side of 50. We've got the latest AFL news with John Pyrrhic, who's grovelled his way back into our hearts. We're taking your questions on Twitter. We've got a far sexier ladder than that stupid thing all about wins and losses. We've got the rant off, of course. And this week, in a Footyology exclusive, we're debuting an exciting new segment created after we spent months analysing surveys, polls and focus groups, and then ignored everything they came up with and just went ahead and did what we wanted to do anyway. So let's get started. As I say, a very good afternoon to you, Finey. Now, you did look a bit green around the gills last week. How are they hanging today? They're hanging all right, mate. Look, it couldn't have been that bad because... Well, there, there's a split screen. Oh, God. Well, I've got to be truthful. I don't really see much difference oh, there. No, I know. Think, I think I was a bit <laughs> shiny last week. But I couldn't be that bad because the uh, makeup department still hasn't paid me a visit at Channel 30. No, yet. no. And good to know your washing machine's getting a decent workout. So, of course, you've got seven of those shirts, haven't you? I'm sponsored by the maker, but, of course, I'll keep the... Are we supposed to cover up logos? <laughs> no, I think it's okay on community TV. Good old Fred Perry, thanks, mate. I don't know who you are, but I love your shirts. Okay, uh, theme of the week for you, very quickly. Um, the theme of the week. Well, all this ducking and diving yeah. business, you think it's just begun. I mean, it's been going on since Paul Callery was a boy. He never grew up. He was little. He got the, the two high and milk. He didn't milk them. It's a system. You work the system and just play the game. The umpires are out there. They'll sort wheat from chaff. It's the commentary from outside. It's noise. It really is white noise to me, that sort couldn't, of stuff. Couldn't agree more. It's exact, that was exactly the theme of my Monday column in The Age. Uh, very overrated debate. And I reckon if it had happened in a Saturday Twilight game, we probably would have heard about a tenth as much. So Spot on. move on to the next controversy. Okay, round 10 was a ripper. Some controversy, some upsets, more stumbles at the top of the ladder, even bigger holes dug at the bottom, laughter and tears, light and shade, big and small, Turnbull and Short and Darth Vader and Luke Skywalker, tomato, tomato. Let's call the whole thing off and get straight to hot or not. Okay, now I had to lead off last week because you were in no condition to talk for a few minutes. I was ailing. Okay, well, you're back on deck. You're back with a vengeance. Kick us off today. All right, I've got what's hot. And what's hot is Sydney, not just that they're on top of the ladder, Rowan. They've seen six players make their AFL debuts this year. I mean, that's normally the domain of teams that are down the bottom of the ladder. This weekend, or last weekend just passed, it was Harrison Marsh. And I thought he was really good, nice and composed. He joins Alir Alir. Tom Papley, who's a great little small forward. George Hewitt, who's held his place in the side. I mean... Callum Mills. Callum Mills. And the... What were your parents thinking when they named you Jack Hiscox? <laughs> what? Well, what, it's good to see the return of George to AFL ranks too, don't you think? There's plenty of George. Very underrated a, name. So I do the quote that we hear on 1116 SEN what all the it? time. There's a million this, there's Georges, there's Callums, there's Aliers, but there's no Kevins. Do you reckon we'll ever have a Kevin again? Well, not after KB led the way. I, I think it would be doing that name a disservice to... I mean, you'd just be merely walking in the shadows of that name. Kevin Morris? Kevin Morris, yeah. It is, it, it is old school. It Kevin. is old school, but... Maybe if we get a Prince Kevin, we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll start getting yeah. a bit of a revival. Never. OK, I'm uh, going off the rank with a hot, and it is the raffle that is the 2016 AFL Premiership. Um, quite unbelievable, and we've talked about A contender presents itself, and they seem to get shot down. And here's some footage of the, uh, the latest hot turn not, and it's the Cats, who were flag favourite, I think, in their own right for about three weeks. But two really ordinary performances against Collingwood and Carlton, and full credit to the Blues. We'll talk plenty about them, don't worry. But uh, the Cats on the nose a bit. GWS took a step back. Couldn't win on the road against Adelaide. The Crows have come up in the credibility stakes. They, they uh, had a really good win against GWS. I, I can't remember a flag race this even, this deep into a season, nearly the halfway point, and we're all the winners for it. It's absolutely fantastic. You know, I was, I was put on the spot during the week, just before the round started on Thursday night, to name my AFL Premiership chances, and I mm. cut it down to five. I actually left GWS in there out of respect, but mm. I 
I tipped them in. <coughs> so to who get are beaten. they, quickly? Well, most importantly, they're not North Melbourne. And this is even before their loss, after 9-0. and 0. Yeah. I just think they've got too many players, the wrong side of 30, starting to show some creaking. You know, Nick Del Santo, I'm not sure about Petrie. Harvey, is he bankable? And there's no way that Jared Waite was ever going to keep that pace up. So who are they, quickly? Hawthorne, always. Yep. Sydney Swans yep. are a bit of a natural. Yep. I put Adelaide in yep. because at their best they've got Agreed. the makeup. I I put GWS in, yeah. you know, out of that sort of level of um, respect for what they've done and yep. the fact that they're young. And Cats? No. No? So who's your fifth? No. Um, I think I've trimmed one. I think <laughs> since, well, that was before the weekend, so yeah. now it's down Well, see, that's how movable a feast it is. Yeah. One's actually dropped off your radar, and they haven't even played another game. No, so. I'm saying that was before the Cats' loss. Okay. Oh, I had a big watch on them anyhow. I'm not sure about the chemistry there. but Ah, no, they're in for me. And you've got to, oh, too much disrespect. Oh, sorry, I had the Bulldogs. I've still got the Bulldogs in there. Okay. Because, because for me, the Bulldogs have covered a lot of losses with, I mean, all off the half-back line almost, with suitable replacements. They've got more depth than any other team. No, they've team. hung in really well. Yeah, okay. Sorry, I didn't have the cats, I had the doggies. That's all right, you're next. Uh, speaking of the doggies, this is, look, they were very lucky to win against Collingwood. Collingwood kept losing players, we know that. H how about the mark of Dalhouse in the third? This is a really important mark. Pretty sure we've got footage of it here. Yeah, we? you be the, you be the judge. Is. Okay. Now, I mean, this this is a, a pivotal mm, time. One. It's a pivotal time of the game. He did not. You've got to take those marks if you're going to pay something yeah. in front of the line. They have got to be held. Yep. absolutely solid. Yeah, that's, there's a that's, juggle that's, on the line, isn't there? Once no there's some, once there's a bit of ball movement, to yeah. me that's not a mark. And that was so it was important. A critical decision. Fifteen in the seconds context. to go in the quarter. Yep. Huge on the scoreboard. Huge for momentum. Yep. And well, it's, they're pretty red hot on them when the when the boundary line's in play, aren't oh, they? Well, that's all I'm saying is on the boundary line, the boundary umpire gets involved and he loves paying no mark. Mm. No. It seems as though the goal umpire didn't want a piece of that. So Well, again, different rule for the scoring zone to yep. seems to be a recurring problem. No, it's a, I like that one. Good call. Okay, I'm up next and it's a not, unfortunately, and... It's a sad one, to be honest. It's Matthew Pavlich from Fremantle. I did that St Kilda Fremantle game. Freo, I've got uh, big issues, obviously, but probably none bigger than their most storied, uh, legendary player who is really, really struggling. And just watching him up close, it just gave you a different perspective on it. There were fumbles. He oh, couldn't yeah. get to the contest. When he did lead the way to the ball, he was spoiled too easily. He's lost his agility, um, obviously lost a bit of confidence. And uh, it's just sad to watch. Now, having said that, I'm not of the school of thought that he needs to retire pronto because I, I think having made the commitment, he'll want to see it out. And look, I'm, you know, I think we should be big enough to respect that, OK, this is a gamble that didn't work. Let him play out the season. They're in a hole. It wouldn't look good for anyone, I think, to have him pull up stumps now. But you know, I, I just hope down the track that people's memories of Pav aren't this last season because uh, this really is a classic case of, you know, they reckon players over the wrong side of 30, you know, once you fall off the cliff, you can really plummet. I reckon this is one of them. You know, players regress. It's like a, a, our own lives. And sometimes the end of a player's <coughs> life can be um, sad. It can be sort of the football equivalent of incontinence and a bit Alzheimer-ish. And unfortunately, that's what's happened so to Pavlis. So you're suggesting Pav should be wearing a nappy? No. But he should be wearing something. I think the greatest football regression was pluggers, but because he took a year off, oh, yeah. he had to wear a different number. Yeah. And I think as you get on in your career, you yeah. should go back to high numbers. At least plugger finished in the 46. So I'd like to see Pav, if he's going to have to play this year out, give him something like 49 or give him a number that shows the regression. Okay, we've got to, to, we've got to zip days. through the last two, yours, yep. in a nutshell. Um, well, I'm going to go for... Uh, a not hot, yeah, and that quick. is the Carlton doctor who assessed Levi Casbolt's Kel leg two weeks ago as broken. Mm. Do you hear what they said now? Yeah, it was a. It's a crease. A cr crease. It was a crease of the X-ray. Ah, <laughs> uh, so all it needed was an iron. It was. A, it didn't need it, a surgery. You needed an iron you know, and, and a, a can of preen. You know the old X-rays on those really thick film plasticky things. Yeah, yeah. There was a little fold, a crease in it. <laughs> uh, lucky it wasn't across his head or his or another part of his body. Oh, Levi's not playing. He's got a he's got a cracked skull and a broken collarbone and 
I mean, come on, read them properly. Uh, yeah, it was a remarkable comeback. Okay, uh, to finish off, I'm going with a hot. And this has got to be, uh, it will be the goal of the year. Eddie Betts, we love him. He's everyone's favourite player. He's everyone's favourite player because he does things like we're about to see here for him. Absolutely the goal of the year. Does well enough just to keep it in. Really smart. Brilliant. Sees an opportunity. Walks around the player on the boundary. And then, bang. What a star he is. And look at that smile. The understated, well, no, sort of half understated celebration. But he's a gun. And actually, that wasn't in the Eddie Betts pocket. Now we're going to have two Eddie Betts pockets at Adelaide Oval. How many pockets can a man have? I... Never have too many pockets. Like those 70s Amco jeans. You know, they had pockets on the knees. And... You can have too many pockets. You can certainly have too many pockets. You can't have too many pockets, I should say, for Eddie Betts. That will not be goal of the year. I'm tipping Eddie Betts to top it. Oh, OK. All right. He always did on the... He kicked another great one during the game. Yeah, he's not short of candidates. Time for a short break. When we come back, our number one news hound is back. Having found out that Wonder Boy wagged school to be here last week and actually dobbing him into the education department just to get his spot on the couch <laughs> back. But first, it's off to the post-game press conferences where Grant Dickinson has caught up with that reporter in Perth who looks like Spicoli from Fast Times at Ridgemont High, made him get a haircut and put some shoes on, but still had time to ask... The pressing questions. Chip and Dale's playing in the reserves. Will they come in? Um, probably not, but um, they're, they're achieving the expectations they've set on each other around having a crack. For over 20 years, Channel 31 has been Melbourne and Geelong's destination for local homegrown no, no, community no, television. No, no, a bit more, more. And now, tell me we're proud to announce the release of our new app which gives you free and unlimited access to all of your favourite Channel 31 shows. Yeah! Binge watch entire seasons of the best community TV programs in Australia, anytime, anywhere, with new content uploaded daily. Viewable on a wide range of mobile and tablet devices. Head over to c31.org.au and follow the links, or go directly to your favourite app store and download the C31 app today. Get it up here. Welcome back to the show and to John Pyrrhic. And he's got a big act to follow after Dan Cheney's tremendous wardrobe effort last week with a designer shirt, jacket and pocket handkerchief. Can the veteran strike back? Find out when he brings you tomorrow's news today. Yeah, not bad, not bad, JP, although the shirt's a bit shabby and I don't see a pocket handkerchief. It's hard to keep up with the young fellas. Did you days, check so him I'm out? I'm he, trying he to get a wardrobe allowance from here. Such but got real splendour. <laughs> Fantastic <laughs> stuff. He measured loves, up. Sorry? No, I measured up very well against Finey as well. Oh, shut up. He loves pockets, so fill them with nice things. I'll try and I'll keep that in mind for next week. Okay, yeah, there's a the fun out of the way, but pretty uh, serious news yeah. day today. Uh, you've been out at the Jared Ruffhead press conference. Yep. Tell us what happened. Yeah, it's a serious and sad day for football, isn't it, today? Jared Ruffhead fronted the media this morning with football operations boss Chris Fagan and the Hawks doctor Michael McDesey. And he's told us there that he has four cancerous spots on his lung. He'll be out of football for the next year. Um, you're going to have treatment soon. It's called immune therapy, where it's a series of injections. Initially, it's once every one every three or four weeks, and then fortnightly after that. And here's a bit of what Jared had to say this morning. Uh, we're still waiting on the footage, so we'll just oh. keep talking about it. How did you find his demeanour generally? Yeah, he was upbeat. He was playing basketball with some of his teammates before training. As soon as the press conference finished, he was out in the paddock having a kick around as well, having a laugh with Jordan Lewis, and took part in full training. So that won't last for too much longer. He, Depending on the, how the treatment unfolds and the side effects, because with this treatment, the side effects, no one really knows what can happen. Some people can get through fine, others may not. So he should be able to hopefully keep up some light training. But overall, he did, doesn't want any sympathy, just wants business as usual, and that's been Hawthorne's mantra since this news broke a week or two ago. I mean, I've got to say, lung cancer, it sounds really bad. Uh, was there, hopefully we'll get to see a bit of the footage, but was there talk about not the prognosis, but exactly what four spots on the lungs mean? Well, all Ruffy would say is he's not planning on going anywhere. Like, there's no thoughts of him, you know, dying or anything like that. And, and the um, good news is, yeah. I mean, because yeah. he was being monitored for yeah. uh, his skin cancer, I mean, yep. melanoma spreads, and the key is to try and stop it, but at least there was early detection. So whatever yep. 
spots there are. We're talking about very early stages of the second stage there of his skin cancer spreading to his lungs, aren't we? Yes, well, as we know, last year he had the melanoma on his lip and was forced out of football for a while, but was able to come back and naturally played in the Premiership. So he's had regular checkups since then. Yep. And I guess the flip side is possibly the one good thing has been the regular checkups in the meantime. And Correct. hopefully they can get on top of this early and he can come back. Well, a lot of people really. Um relieved I think to see him there and talking and addressing the uh, media and, and the public in general and we have got that footage now so uh, let's have a look at what Joe Ruffhead oh, had yeah, to say. It's been amazing I mean since the news broke um, not only for me but you know my wife and family and, yep. and everyone you know you've had other teams um, <coughs> Teammates, other other opposition players, clubs, fans, um, just the general public have been unreal. You know, you know when you've got 100% backing, it means a fair bit. Is that, is that, is that the thing that gets you up when you're feeling down? Uh, yeah, well, <clears throat> I'm not feeling down at the moment because you know I know what I have to do and I know that um, it's going to be a bit of a battle for the next 12 months. But you know. At the end of the day, I'm, I'm still here, I'm still fine. It's not like I'm going anywhere. Yes. So, you know, when we go to the airport, you don't have to be there taking photos of me. And, and uh, you know, if I'm in the coach's box, just treat me as a, like you normally would. You know, unfortunately, I'm not playing. And, you know, you guys were looking forward to me coming back, and so was I. But at the end of the day, you know, for everyone to just treat me normal is what, what you want, you know. I don't the treatment want... is one of the, uh, or the new immune therapy, so it's not traditional chemotherapy. Um, and um, there's been a fair bit of news about the immune therapy. It, it's uh, been over the past few years, so it's really changed the landscape of melanoma treatment. Um, the, the advantage is you don't get the typical side effects of chemotherapy. The disadvantage is we don't know what the side effects are going to be. So uh, we go there expecting, you know, a really good result and, you know, young, fit bloke hopefully tolerates it really well. Yeah, interesting stuff. Thanks to Fox Sports for that footage as well. Look, we all know Ruffy. We know what a great bloke he is. I'm, I'm tipping uh, he's grown that mo because this is about the only chance he'll get to get away without getting uh, slagged off for it. It's not a great mo, <laughs> let's be honest. He's had it for a while, hasn't he, since he came <laughs> back, I think. So I think it's part of helping protect himself as well. From no, this, well, actually. look, from at footy, everyone at Footyology and everyone in the football world, get well, Ruffy. We're all uh, we're all in your corner. I guess Quickly, on, on a football note, yep. where does this leave the Hawks, do you think? In terms oh, of look, I think, I think they've got their issues. They've really yeah. struggled without him up forward. Um, relying more on the smaller goal kickers. James Sicily st standing up, having a pretty good mm. season. But the thing with Ruffy is it's the amount of ball he wins and, and uh, contests he wins in the middle of the ground as well as up forward. He's such a multi-dimensional player. So, yeah. look, they will miss him. But, you know, look, it could give him a real emotional G up too. And uh, yeah. I don't think anyone that's got half a brain is riding Hawthorne out of this premiership race. Yeah. Any, anything else? Oh, just at Hawthorne as well. Uh, Matty Spanger, we saw him return against Brisbane at the weekend very briefly for a couple of minutes, in fact. Um, he, that was only his fifth game <coughs> since the 2014 Grand Final. Well, he's ripped his hamstring and looks mm. like being out for quite a while. So it's going to be a tough call on him at the end of the season, whether he goes on. I'm, I'm just on that, I know they played him, I think they played him in the VFL a couple of times, but yep. Seen him a few was times. he rushed back? I mean, in terms of that injury, obviously the load in the VFL allows you to not necessarily go as hard as in the AFL. Should he have played last week? Well, I've watched a few of the Box Hill Hawks games in the VFL at City Oval recent times, and he's looked pretty well there. And Hawthorne's not a team that rushes anyone back, so I, yeah. I doubt that was the case. Well, quick one, where's Schoenmakers at? Because they, they haven't done well with their big blokes. Recently. No, he's had a pretty patchy season, hasn't he? He's another guy that's going to be under the pump this year. He's played a bit in the VFL and didn't start the AFL season off well. So we thought it was going to be his breakout year, didn't we, after how he played in the grand final? And just finally at Richmond, and Sam Lloyd, the hero of the win against the Swans a few weeks ago, he's out of contract. His management wants to get something done soon, but I think the, the Tigers are sort of balking at that at the moment and are prepared to wait. Really? So we'll see, we'll see what happens there. I'm surprised they're balking at it. I mean, uh, maybe there's a bit of money as a sticking point, but he's a really good player. And yep. They want to be careful because a, another club would snap up a Sam Lloyd. Yeah, well, there's play. a few list management decisions there to be made, so obviously um, we'll find out soon. All right, thanks, uh, JP. Of course, the veteran struck back, man on the spot, out there with all the big guns. Uh, no, it's great stuff on the Ruffy press conference, and uh, we'll let you off with your dress sense for now. Oh, uh, I'll head back to Peter Jackson this week. Hopefully they can do a good deal for I'm me. I'm glad you said that, because <laughs> any time someone that says that, like everyone, I have to go, Peter Jackson. Uh, thanks, guys. You'll join us back <laughs> yep. for the credibility letter.
Let's get to another break. When we return, it's the same crappy set, the same crappy host, but a whole brand spanking new segment. Games are hard to win in this competition, but um, we right at the moment are a shadow of the team we were even three weeks ago. How are you going with that jigsaw puzzle? I'm trying to work it out. Okay, so I was just, just asking. No, I mean it's not as it's not. There are lots of little pieces, but there's nothing obvious. Welcome back, and we're really excited about this. We've taken on board the feedback about Finey and I being stuck in the past. And after much consideration, we've decided to piss you off even more by giving you more nostalgia. Round 10 has contained some of the biggest moments in football history, and we're going to revisit them right now because, like sand through the hourglass, so are the rounds of our lives. I really like that intro. It's it's poignant. It's accurate because <laughs> <laughs> the, the, those sounds do travel very quickly, Rob, and we're going to go back in time, and unfortunately for us, it's going to feel like yesterday. Well, yes, and the first one, we're going 40 years back, in fact, all the way back to 1976, round 10, 1976. The venue is Princess Park. This is one of the great football moments, finally. We've all seen it, but let's see it again. North Melbourne's playing Carlton. The Blues are up all day. They're 18, oh, I think 17 points up. Malcolm Blight takes a mark, kicks a goal. 11 points the difference. 30 minute mark, I think. Ball kicked into the north forward line. Malcolm Blight marks on the boundary. Check side's a beautiful goal. It's back to five points. Can they get up? You'd think there's not enough time, but the ball gets rebounded into the forward line again from the centre bounce. Malcolm Blight takes the mark. Have a guess who you've got to say. Have a guess who, Malcolm Blight. He was in the previous two, obviously. Yeah. He bobs up again. And let's have a look at it right now. Malcolm Blight has got the ball out. Centre half forward. 28 minutes gone. The crowd's gone mad. There's the centre. And Siren's gone. Now Blight will have to take his kick. Now Blight would have to kick this. Oh, he'd have to kick it 85, 90 metres. But he's going to have a kick, all right. It's not over yet. <coughs> How good is that? Oh, well, that? Look, the commentary is magnificent. Yeah, Mike Williamson. He, he was a great commentator, he Mike was, Williamson. Absolutely. A have you got the same line I have going through it? I've seen it all. I've seen it all. It was. It is one of the most amazing kicks of all time. But I love the side. There are moments in time, and I love looking at what else is happening at that time. Keith Griggs sort of stalking around him with his hands <laughs> on his hips and Barry Cable. They've given the game up for absolute dead. Fans are running running onto the ground, but it's funny how they don't all run to the actual play. Some are going to have their own kick to kick. <laughs> Could not care about that. There are kids running away from that kick, not watching it. At the game, never saw the kick. Now, having wrapped up Mike Williamson, I do have to say, he did add a bit of mayo to the distance. Metres? There, or 90, 95 yeah. metres. In fact, I did a ghost tour of um, Princess Park last year with, with the, the Carlton Footy Club with Tony DeBolfo and yeah. Luca Ganano. And it's a great thing to do. They're still doing them, I think. But we went to that spot on the ground. And I've got to say, I looked up and I thought, geez, I reckon I'm half a chance from here. It seemed <laughs> to have shrunk. Actual distance, I reckon, distance out from goal, I reckon about 65, 70. But the kick, almost post high, it's got to be 80 metres. And that's another part of that folklore that goes with this, because it did almost go through post, goal, post high. high. So a lot of people who were at the game, um, seem to forget that there's actual footage of it because they talk about it going through post high and then rattling over the, the entry gates. It actually, oh. it actually dropped quite quickly into the crowd, but I've heard it told of the ball actually clearing the, clearing the ground itself and yeah. being found in the car They've park. They've whacked a bit of mayo on that yeah. too. Okay, let's go to the next one. And it's another very memorable moment. The venue is the Western Oval. Round 10, 1984, Collingwood, Footscray, a Titanic struggle. Oh, this is great. Mick Malthouse's first year as coach. Collingwood a few points up, seconds to go. Graham Allen, what have you done? He's You've done, kicked across goal to Greg Phillips. He's done what everybody now does, but back then was verboten. Oh, look at and there's empathy. Jimmy Edmund. The, the, the empathy, <laughs> the compassion. He's down him. And the trainer comes in and says so. As a whack as well. Oh, the Footscray trainer. Simon Beasley, lining up. Beasley, <laughs> I'll do the commentary. 
Beasley. Kicks for goal. The Bulldogs are in front. Ha <laughs> ha, suck on that, Magpies. <laughs> no, I don't think that was the commentary. Oh, great. Uh, Mick great Moldhouse goal. in the box. Yep. Oh, very memorable moment that, wasn't it? Yeah, uh, the elephant man kicked it through for the... I always thought he did look a little bit like Zon Merrick with the large head. Zon Beasley. Well, the big head and the wispy hair that didn't quite cover the entire scalp. But I love the trainer. <laughs> and actually getting tripped by a Footscray trainer. He's just some kid with a water bowl. Yeah, you can't kick Well, me. we could do a whole segment on that. If you watch the 84 grand final when Dipper KO's Kevin Walsh, one of the Essendon trainers comes out. He's almost about to go, Dipper. Well, I don't think that would have ended well, though. Well, the famous Richmond Essendon brawl at Windy Hill. The trainer with the towel. Yeah. There is history. <laughs> All right, let's move on. Now, this is one of the great rounds around 10 because next on our list is another famous or infamous moment in football history. It's round 10, 1996. The venue is Waverley. The teams are St Kilda Essendon. Tight game, late in the third quarter. What happens, Finey? This happens. Oh. I, was oh. There. I was there. We're out of juice. Well, we'll both tell our stories. <laughs> I was there covering the game. Now, there's Malcolm Blight talking by candlelight. We were in the press box. I had an old tape recorder that had a red light when you hit record. I had to leave that on so I could see the keyboard in my pissy little NEC laptop I had. And it was just amazing. We had, um, I was there with Michael Lovett, now with the AFL. And he was chasing stuff around in the rooms. And look at this. Chaos. Well, People ripping out point posts. You were in that group, weren't you? I, you started that bonfire. No comments. I... They, I don't know who they are, sociologists, anthropologists, experts say that the social order, the fabric of society will collapse after, what, 72 hours or even less without electricity. And Really? Well, they, down to the point, when I've heard this said that if the, every traffic light went out in Melbourne, that would take only 12 hours before the city sank into total, <laughs> and, you know, people would abandon, abandon social norms and mob rule would ensue. Well, there was something funny about the electricity out near Waverley because remember Tim Lane always used to um, complain about the turning arrow into VFL Park and it never go on for him. So I reckon that was probably the start of the, the chaos that ensued this evening. I always wanted to know what actually caused the blackout because we had such a scant respect for Waverley. I always thought somebody had put a double adapter in one of the, where you are, the press room and the whole thing blew up because they used the one power source for, well, I th I for two was, things. I think, seriously, I think it was actually something outside, but I don't think we ever heard what it was. It was a substation somewhere no. near the ground. It was light bulb 57321 <laughs> on the old sepia scoreboard. Well, it was 1996. It was probably someone uh, jamming the VCR with, uh, what was big, Ghostbusters 2 or something? Maybe a bill not paid? A bill, yeah. Look, who knows? Who it, was, knows? it was St Kilda was involved. Was it, our, was it our home game? Uh, yes, it was. Well, we probably didn't, and pay, of course the, they didn't pay the bills. played the last, what, 40 minutes on the following Tuesday evening, as D you do. Dis and disgracefully, and I mean this, they allowed Essendon to make play. changes. Yeah, I know. I think the Bombers would have won anyway, finally. They were well on the way to a comfortable victory. All right, two to go. And would you believe it, another monumental moment in football history the year is 1999, the venue is the SCG, the teams are Sydney and Collingwood, and Tony Lockett, one of the great, if not the greatest full forward of all time, is about to break Gordon Coventry's long-standing record of 1,299 goals. Let's check it out. Lockett entered the match against Collingwood, needing three goals to write a new chapter in the code, and wasted little time in reaching for the record books. He's going to get back. Black has got it. He's going to equal the record. It's all oh. scored. <laughs> One, two, double nine. Then, just Breaking before the, the first record. break, Sydney launched another attack, and Swans captain Paul Kelly had no trouble finding the imposing figure in jersey number four. So, for 90 years, the Collingwood Footy Club have held the record, and for 62 years, it stood at 12.99. Will he write his name in the record book forever? Come on, buddy. With this kick, it's going to go! It's going to go! It's going to And aren't we privileged to be a little part of it? A remarkable player ensures the fact However long we play the game, he will be remembered forever. 
amazing how much he has to sign just as a bloke on the mark. Really? Yeah, I mean, people just want to frame that piece of yeah, football the, history. The step ladders for great marks is one yeah. thing, but that's sort of taking it to a new level. Unlike Mel to make a buck out of something like no, that. No, he's a good bloke. No, he's a great bloke. Good on you, Mel, if you're watching. Okay, one more, and it's not all that long ago. We're going back to 2012. Mark Neald is coach of Melbourne. It's been a desolate start to the season by the Demons. They've lost their first nine games. The situation looks bleak. Where's that first win going to come from? Well, wouldn't you know it, Finey, not for their first or last time in the last few years. Essendon plays the bunny. Highly favoured to win. Should have had the game wrapped up, but they left the door open and the Demons charged through. I'm pretty sure we got footage of the closing stages of that game and you'll see the elation. In the Melbourne camp. The day they said would never come. Oh, yes. And there it is. It just wraps it up. Wouldn't that make the difference? 11 points. I was, as, as usual, I was in the press box covering the game. And of course, that was done in the pink yoke. Yes. Uh, for breast cancer awareness. Something, something the club Melbourne's very acutely aware of is. Uh, cancer on a, a day where we've been talking about it. And we'll just we'll see the bench here. There he is. Yes. Slams the headset down. Yes. You'll pay for that, Neil. Yes. So who, who hugged him there? Colin with Jeremy Howe? Colin Garland, Colin Jeremy Garland's Howe. And I think Lyndon Dunn on the left there. Yes. Crowd's gone mad. Of course, their sights have uh, raised considerably since then. This is just a win. Got a few of them up now. Look at this, this is fantastic. Brad Green's Green. there, they're all in. Got the glove on, Brad Green. Uh, great moments for the day. Yeah. And Mark Neal, still involved, of course, at Essendon, and uh, in all seriousness, doing a great job with development down there. They're a huge rap for him. Maybe got the job on the back of that win. Well, that's it for uh, our first viewing of Rounds of Our Lives. We'll be back with more football history next week. I'm getting a little teary with all this reminiscing. But when we come back, it's back to the 21st century, to the world of social media, and your chance to engage, interact, and slag us off. Thanks for joining us here on Footyology. Time for some Twitter action. Send us all your footy questions using the Footyology hashtag and Finey and I will not only answer them but probably go off on some completely unrelated tangent as well. Let's get cracking on keyboard Q&A. Okay, Finey. Now, someone complained to me yes. via Twitter yesterday that you hadn't tweeted for 19 days. Yes, I have. Explain have, yourself. Um, as you know... Twitter comes with the banter, the to and fro that you're so very good at. And what you do? you're good at banter. What are you talking about? Yeah, but I press go on. You know, look, I don't want to make more enemies. Right. And I certainly don't want any of yours. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. What well, do you think? My enemies are more dangerous than your enemies. Well, you foster them. It's like you've got a culture and you're growing <laughs> them in a, in a lab. They, they morph into more and more vitriolic type people. So I will be back on it and I'll make a promise that by the close of play this afternoon, that is by the time I step on the air for radio at seven o'clock, there'll be new tweets and I'll be a more um, conscientious tweeter from here on in. Okay, take that on board everyone. He is a man of his word. You will see tweets from Mark Fine this afternoon. About you. Uh, about me. Oh, well, why not? <laughs> You've got me all wrong. You know. I'm really soft, fluffy, cuddly, Marshmallowy type creature, you know. That I'm sums like, up your body, not your personality. Yeah, I know. Very good. Very good. <laughs> okay, let's get to the tweets, you bastard. Uh, okay. Hu do you want me to do the names? Uh, you do the names. The humanismism. Oh, yeah, uh, mouthful, that one. Josh Gibson's 200th game this week. I can't recall a more consistently good player at Hawthorne on a week to week basis. Thoughts? Very good call. Look, I disagree. Uh, yeah, no, look, uh, it's. I don't know, there'd be a few ahead of him, but. You're talking about a bloke who has won two best and fairest. Not only that, he's won two best and fairest in two premiership years. That is about as good as it gets. I reckon winning a club best and fairest is one thing. Winning it in the premiership year, you can't play much better footy than that. You can't, which is why he's not consistent. He doesn't win it every year. No, I'm kidding. They've just got consistent players. Mm. I really think Sean Burgoyne... You know, I've, I've watched Sean Burgoyne this year. I want to see some signs of, of 
human in him because humanism is... What do you think, he's a cyborg? Well, or? I don't understand it. When he came to Hawthorne, I know this is about Gibson, but when Burgoyne came to Hawthorne, I thought he had a couple of years, maybe a good footy left in him. Yeah. Not a single percent of drop-off. Well, they know how to look every after week, their players. But every week he's good. I think Gibson... But back on Gibson, yeah, I, I mean, if, you t- if you're yeah. using that as a... Like, North Melbourne, I remember when he left, North didn't want him to go. No. But there's no way North Melbourne thought he was anywhere near the sort of player he's turned out to be. You know what they thought? And this is, I can tell you sort of as a fact. They thought he's a good player that Hawthorne have become very much enamoured with because he had good form against Buddy. Mm. They, think, they thought they... that. It was a rose-coloured glasses view of a pretty good player. Mm. No, he's a very good player. He's probably a champion. Great mates too, Buddy and Gibbo. Yeah. I think they've got great form off the field as well, from and all accounts. They actually are a very fun, funny and fun duo. They used to hang around my haunts, and as long as they're not being footy pestered, they actually... He, Gibbo does the best impersonations. He's a real talent. I mean, he's funny, not footy funny. He's a great impersonator. Very funny. All right, let's move on. Next. Okay, name? PM6. PM6, of course. Sorry. Who asks? Can Collingwood still make the finals? Better learn on the day. Better to learn on the day uh, than Bulldogs. Sorry, better team on the day. How am I going? But no rotations left. Yes, they were. I, I, it's one of those games where I've got absolutely no doubt had they not had no one on the bench in the last quarter, they would have won. They, they controlled that game for three quarters. Not on the scoreboard, but they yeah, did. Bulldogs were pretty fortunate. But that's look. Sometimes teams lift when for a one-off and get through the no rotations, but not no rotations. Maybe two players down, but every time they seem to sort of adjust, they lose another player. I don't think they can make the finals. Though their their fixture is not a gimme, and there's just too many teams between them and the coveted eighth spot. Yeah, two games off the pace. And, and Darcy Moore's out now. Yeah, he's he's a good player, Darcy. So Cloak comes back. Yeah. Oh, look, I, one thing I'd say, we said this about Richmond all year, two years ago, and they ended up making it. They did have to win nine in a row, however. Okay, we've got to move quicker. Next sure. tweet from... Near as Senior. Who asks? Or near as Bolton, SHR. Pike, Warsfold, Brad Scott, or someone else for Coach of the Year? Uh, no contest for me. Brendan Bolton. Brendan Bolton. Yeah. Um, from where they were coming, 15 new players, wooden spoon, uh, remake of a club... First coaching appointment. You can't do any better. They've been they're five and five. Was Cameron in that list there? No, I don't think so. He, d- he, he deserves be to be in the too. discussion. He should be. Yeah. Okay, next from this is from Harry Travers. Should the demons still sell games to Darwin? Poor record there, and club no longer in dire financial trouble. Well, was Alice Springs, of course, on the weekend. Trig- Your uh, thoughts? No, I don't like selling games to no. other. And Port Adelaide, what a team to give a. Uh, a bit of a, well, it's not home state, but I think South Australians are more akin to playing. Well, it's closer to Alice than Melbourne. It is closer, and they just, there's some kinship between South Australia and Northern Territory that probably should be one state. Mm. Yeah, no, I don't like the selling games. I mean, it reached farcical levels when I think the Bulldogs sold a home game uh, and played on the SC, a home game against the Swans on the SCG. I mean, that's just farcical. I'm surprised you let me just, that one go through to the keeper, that South Australia and Northern Territory should be. Morphed into one state. Called. You know, huh? Why? Called avoid it. Um, <laughs> what did you want me to say? Sorry. No, normally you said, no, you can't do that. Northern oh, Territorians no. have got a proud history of independence. <laughs> no, no. I don't care about Northern Territory. Sorry. G'day to all our friends in Darwin. And there's beautiful a beautiful place in the world. I <laughs> haven't no. been there, but I'm sure it's beautiful. You know, I, I, you, know, I, you know we're on air in South Australia. Yeah. No, I love South Australia. I lo- love Adelaide okay. uh, and Adelaideans, particularly Chris Kenny. Just kidding. Um, one more. I think we've got a few more. Come on, we've got to go through these faster. Who's, that, who's this from? This one is from Lockie St. Clair. Why is Lindsay Thomas the only one being targeted uh, around the dropping the knees high contact issue? Can I answer that one? Couldn't agree more. Yep. It's because all North Melbourne supporters have got a chip on the shoulder. That is bull. What, Paulopolo doesn't come... No, but he doesn't cop the amount of a program oh, that Lindsay Thomas has. Come on, North. Uh, North's a great club. Stop having a chip on your shoulder. They never talk about us. They never say we're going to... Uh, pre- so you don't think Thomas has copped more than he should have? He's, he oh, ranks- Selwood. No one's ever mentioned Selwood in this no, discussion. No, no, they have. But, you know, the, the stupidest comment I heard all week, and it was from one leading commentator, he said that Selwood goes about his staging for freeze in a manlier way than Lindsay Thomas does. Like, what? 
And so what about the staging for free? I don't get the whole thing. Grant Thomas, actually, we're big fans of Grant Thomas, but Grant Thomas called it un-Australian. Un-Australian to stage for a free? <laughs> you can have a whole debate about what actually constitutes our national identity. And if I think un-Australian, I tend to think things a bit more important than staging for free kicks in a football game. When I, th when I hear un-Australian, do you know what I think? Uh, no. What a bug. I don't want to talk to you anymore. And what a term. Not un un-Australian. Do you know what's un-Australian? What? Not putting pineapple on a pizza. Ah, uh, well, I'm happily un-Australian. There I can't you go. Stand you see? You're sweet. Now, we're going to have a whole show on sweet and savoury foods. Do not mix. Will not have them. No sultanas in those meat casserole things. No pineapple on pizza. No sweet and sour. No sweet and sour. Don't tell me we're short of time. No, we are. I'm just, I don't know what, <laughs> what happened to me there. Have we got time for any more? Yeah, we're going to no, have one no, more. No, no, we don't. Yes, we're going to have one more. It's from... The Moctimist. Of course. Who are Sydney's form is again unbelievable. Is Longmire's record better than Rue's? And how does it compare against all the greats? All-time greats. Look, I, I think this is a really good call. Now, obviously, longevity is a factor here. He's in his sixth season. But he's already equaled Ruse for achievements. Two grand finals for one premiership. And uh, winning percentage, um, in fact, I did write, write down before, Longmire is at, after six seasons, 69%. Oh, oh, yeah, oh, percent. Oh, and let me, Ruse let me, is on 51. I was going to guess both of them. Oh, right, sorry. Because I knew them. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, now let's pretend I didn't do it. Um, no. He's got a fantastic winning percentage. I wish I knew what it was. I, I don't I, suppose you know, Finey. I could guess, 69.17. Hang on. Yeah, that's right. And Paul Roos, what do you think Paul Roos is? This is wasting time because we've just got another essay, uh, another tweet in, actually. Have we? Yeah, we just got told about it. Oh, did you? Yeah. That's funny because you haven't got an earpiece. But let's have a look. Where's this phantom tweet? It, it's, <laughs> come to me. it's come to me by... Oh, the, it's from the governor, a regular SEN caller. Who no, says, no, it's not that one. Oh, Okay. Is Chris Scott <laughs> a PR man manager coach instead of a hands on coach like Bomber Thompson and Brendan Bolton? Uh, no idea. No, I, I think that's really harsh and, and sort of weird because Bomber Thompson, they stripped back his sort of PR man management side so he could concentrate on coaching. I know you're not a big fan of Chris Scott, Gov, but I, I rate him. I reckon he's a smart guy. His achievement in coming in and taking that side to the 2011 Premiership, I think, has been underestimated. Like people were saying they were done and dusted at the end of 2010. Okay. No, thanks. Yeah, I've just been given what the phone. Doing? I've just been given the phone with the tweet. Okay, quick. What does it say? Rowan, I've noticed that you've got some damage to the knuckles on your right hand. Who has copped Rowan Connolly's rage? Well, it's actually my left, left hand. You see, that's TV, isn't it? Uh, okay, can we pick that it up? It is your left hand. What has been... Who, you haven't been in a Donnybrook, a brouhaha. It looks like it, doesn't it? Okay, a melee. I'll fess, I'll fess up here. I had some internet issues at home last Thursday. Oh, no. And after being on the phone to Telstra, to one of those call centres, for half an hour and going through the, yes, uh, thank you, we just want to check some details. And who hasn't done that? I, in frustration, leaned to my left and punched the wall. However, my internet is working again. Thank you, Telstra. Uh, I'll never look at people in call centres the same way again, but this is the sort of thing that can happen when your internet goes down. Thanks for pointing that out to the viewing public. Don't hit me. No, you no, just no. W watch your P's and Q's and we'll get on with it. Okay, thanks for your contributions. Another break now. When we return, the only ladder in town where last week's wooden spooner can be this week's top dog. Tune in or I'll give you one of these. <laughs> Leon, um, there's rumours coming out of the playing group that you start talking fully and then you go into these long-winded things about your holidays and your travel plans. And it's, Is that getting to the players, do you think? Um, it's a good question. Um, we played 10 games. Um, obviously, we, we have a second home in Canberra, but we still travel. Right. Which is, I mean, it's fantastic going to Canberra. We've been on the road 6 out of 10. Um, we've got to go again next week. Uh -huh. oh, I think it's probably... Okay. Um, right. We've got um, obviously this week to Adelaide, next week to Geelong. Okay. Yeah. But we have to ask me in about three weeks when we how you actually return. Right. Welcome back. The annual tanking debate has reared its ugly head again, but there's never an issue here on Footyology. 
because our tried and trusted formula offers incentive only for never say die performance. We don't just reward wins, we reward good old fashioned gut and determination on the credibility ladder. That's a big head you've got on that uh, graphic. Funny, have you, have you had a word to management about that? If anybody knew how <laughs> funny my family finds that, I, I'm not a handyman, <laughs> I don't have overalls, yeah. and I have a pathological fear of climbing up ladders. Oh, good, so I've covered all bases. Welcome back, John Perry. Good to be here. You look like a bit of a handyman, John. You whip down to the, uh, you pop down to the tool shed and whip up a spice rack on the weekend. Put the stubby shorts on and the singlet at home. Uh, can I just let you in a little <laughs> secret? There is not a single person in the media, let alone football media, who has any sort of practical skills at all. We're all complete idiots with our hands, aren't we? That's why we well, rise and talk. You've yeah. been around to everyone's house, have you? Uh, no, but yeah. it's a, okay. It's Some a of generalisation. <laughs> it's not a generalisation. Didn't Patrick Smith try to fix a uh, tile on his roof and fell off? And I mean, I thought that was Molly Meldrum. <laughs> well, he's in the media too. There you go. There you go. It just underlines my point. Let's get on with it. You always <laughs> derail me, Fine. Actually, I've come up with the dribble today, and you fight along with it. It's Fine. your influence, Mark Fine. <laughs> Okay, let's have a look at this later. Now, I'm sh I've gone ahead and made several executive decisions, about 18 of them, in fact. But I'm sure we're all in unison. There can only be number one, one team sitting at number one this week. And it is... You know what? I almost put away years of... And it wasn't hatred, it was jealousy of the Carlton Football Club. I, I, no, no, just you're treading on my turf for later in the, no. <laughs> later in the no, show. But I'm just, say, I'm just saying, I actually am really pleased for them and for Brendan Bolton. I had the good fortune of interviewing him the week before he took up with Box Hill, yeah. and that was a controversial appointment. He was going into the VFL as a school teacher. He's a ripper, and they, they respond is. to him. It's nice to see players actually and a team clearly doing it as one and doing it for the, for the right reason, and in this case, the right bloke. They've been great. Uh, they've, they've shown improvement week to week, so we're, we all agree. Yep, definitely, yeah. Okay. Modern game plan system's great. All right, now I've got two contenders for second and third this week. One of them is Sydney, the perennials. They just get the job done every week. Big test against the only undefeated side in the comp, and they passed it comprehensively. Midfield got on top, dangerous up forward, and uh, once again, well, they're equal premiership favourites now with a couple of other clubs, but... A uh, couple more games, and I think there's every chance they might be um, outright flag favourites. And my other contender there, don't underestimate this win, Adelaide's win over GWS. Now, the Giants have been hot. Yes, it was at home, but the Crows have had a few knockers recently, and I think they've lost three out of four. And this has been a, a superb win. Um, just too good for them, really. Won the midfield battle again. Dangerous up forward. And I'm a big fan of the Crows in premiership terms, so I, I think they're a real chance. So well, they had Sydney, their best third quarter, didn't they, in about 14, yeah. 15 years? No, they that's terrific. That Sydney Adelaide, what's your call? I'd probably go Crows, actually. They needed a big scout. They lost to North Melbourne, Hawthorne, a couple of other sort of top six teams. So. All right, well, uh, almost right. But go on quick. I agree with you, actually. I think Sydney deserve... Yeah, knocked to, off to, an undefeated yeah, side. Yeah, we've sort of been maybe downgrading them a bit because we expect a lot from them. They beat the 9-0 and and beat them really well. There we go. Okay, much quicker, much quicker is the call. So quicker I shall go. Next, Collingwood, Port Adelaide, GWS. Now, what's the common denominator there? We've got two um, losers and one winner in that next group, but uh, gallantry point, big gallantry points for both the Pies and GWS, I think. You know, they didn't lose by a yep. lot and uh, they were coming off six They came in back row. into it in that last quarter as well. Uh, yeah, next, we've got Western yeah. Bulldogs, St Kilda, uh, just a win over an undefeated side. Hawthorne, based on one quarter, really. Richmond next. Weren't overly impressive against the Bombers. I'll put in Brisbane next because I think for three quarters they gave it a red hot crack. In fact, if I had my time again, and I didn't, I might have Brisbane a little bit higher. Underneath them, we've got the Roos. Big test of the Roos. Can't say they passed it. Disappointing. Fremantle played two quarters of decent footy. Essendon, more of the same from the Bombers. OK, last debate, and we've got 45 seconds to have it. Okay. Gold Coast, Geelong, Melbourne. Who takes a wooden spoon? Gold Coast. No. Who takes a wooden spoon? Demons. 
So Geelong. <laughs> Geelong. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's a demon. Well, I just thought that worked better. Uh, no, Melbourne. Yeah, that was a pretty ordinary performance. Step back, wasn't, wasn't it? it? Yeah, yeah. I told you it was Melbourne. Geelong, disappointing. That's two weeks in a row now. They've been ordinary. Yeah, I'm, uh, very disappointing. Yeah. And Gold Coast. Jeez, we're going to have a revisit. Apparently, Rocket Aid reckons they can still make the finals. Are they still in the league, the Gold Coast? <laughs> I don't know. Well, they can make the finals. <laughs> I don't know what you're on, Rocket. <laughs> Last week it was uh, Graham Corns. Now Rocket's been on the jungle. Jeez. The spirit of all the dead Gold Coast sporting teams are, come and join <laughs> us, come and join us. That was quite at those Coast proportions. Rollers. Anyway, there's a credibility <laughs> ladder for this week as our sales out the window. Thanks for joining us, JP. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Uh, now, what are you going to do when Wonder Boy comes home from school this afternoon? I hear he's been given a detention for that wagon school <laughs> episode last week. Yeah, he got himself in a bit of strife, but we'll have him back soon. You know what, he's the school bully. He's Look. the age of school bully. <laughs> Archetypal. Look at him. One of the great episodes <laughs> of the Yarns, Tom Cookson's school days. <laughs> All right. We're going to throw you on the school maggot heap. All, All right. right. Thanks. Thanks for joining us. See you back next week. Time for our final break now. And on return, it's no more Mr. Nice Guys. It's a couple of crotchety old buggers winding up for a bigger serve than Roscoe Tanner. And we know you're upset that Kevin Barber got a statue outside the G and you didn't get one. Do you think you're in line for one and how do you feel? I don't believe so, but... Fun. Yeah, it is unfortunate, but if you were to get one, can you give us an impression of what face you'd pull for the statue? Uh. Welcome back. There's a lot of angst in the football world about teams, coaches, underperforming stars, development academies, and players who continue to sport man buns. But all that's just pleasantries compared to the thunder about to be unleashed when Finey and I go completely crazy eight bonkers on the footyology rant off. There, I struck a happy medium there. It wasn't too holy. Was that okay with it? Well, you are an actor now in parts. <laughs> okay. I think it's improving. All right, yes. Well, we've got to, we've got to tighten up here, so okay, I'm going to count you, you in straight away. Let's Get ready to rant. Oh, 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 stupid. Okay, don't break your arm. Or the set. Actually, if it's like Levi Casbolt, we'll just grab an iron and <laughs> iron out the crease. Three, two, one, rant! I hate sentimentality, and I hate the idea that everything was better back then and much worse now at the football. That was an Eddie had the other day, and I ate like a king. A curry quarter time. I had a beautiful Moroccan something at half time and a stomach ache by three quarter time, but at least I had choices. And people love to say back in the day the food was cheap and plentiful. It was not good and it was not good value. Remember the olden days? There were only four choices. There was the super dog. Super in that for some reason 14 inches of hot dog was meant to stay together by some miraculous performance of chemistry. It never did, it fell apart, but who cared? Because the bread and the sausage were made out of the same thing anyhow, only with different colour dyes in them. Horrible. They had hamburgers that were neither burger nor edible. Their chips, hot chips, were never ever good value, and the pies came in two types, cold congealed or lava, hot, burning and inedible. And how about those stupid kids that used to walk around with their choices for aisle service? Why did they make a distinction between the confectionery? Drinks, lollies and chocolates should have been one cry. And then potato chips, they could have had another product. It wasn't good, it was limited, crappy, and quite frankly, not Moroccan. <laughs> Very good, except I'm really hungry now. And I could have gone somewhere with the 14 inches of hot dog, but uh, family show and all that. No, very good. Scored it well. Thanks, mate. Okay, count me in quick. Three, two, begin. What's going on in the football world, Finey? Everything's gone skew if. There's no clear premiership favourite. Fremantle's gone from a flag contender to likely wooden spooner. And now Carlton's turned into everyone's second favourite team. Yeah, that's right. Carlton. The mob have made an art form of being hated when they were good, then provided fodder for thousands of memorable footy gags when they turn rubbish. I don't know this Brendan Bolton bloke thinks he is, getting the players to enjoy themselves and start playing attractive football that has people actually praising their success. Where's the respect for tradition? Even Carlton's administration has turned nice. They haven't tried to take over another club or made any jokes about the Western Bulldogs' support base for years now. 
It's not good enough. And there's only one solution. That's to bring back John Elliott as president. Yes, that's right. I want Big Jack front and centre at the Blues next game, lining up a cigar with a $100 bill, blowing smoke over everybody, and then butting it out on a disabled kid's forehead. That's the Jack we all know and love. I want high-priced imports. Christian Ronaldo, Steph Curry, Tom Brady. Say they've never played AFL, but at least they'll ponce around looking like they own the joint and charge people for their autograph. And come on, Brendan Bolton, you're too nice. Start dirtying up a bit at the press conferences, giving Steve-O a clip around the ears and treating that junior reporter like a half-wit because he dared ask a question. Football needs an arrogant, unlikable Carlton. Start doing your part, Blues, except the winning premiership spit. Because that's an atrocity no one should be subjected to. Well, that, you are a cheat. Why? First of all, that was brilliant. Thank you. Secondly, I have to be quick so you can do an extra long one. No, I reckon it seems to me to be <laughs> cheating. To be all right. Honest. Well, we, if we ever get that bloody clock up on screen, we'll be able to uh, to work out whether they're on cue or not. I'm going to lose the vote this week. Why? What is it? Quick. I, well, the vote this week, because I did a food theme, it's easy. Make a crock and bush, which is a profiterole custard-filled profiterole tower joined by sponge, sugar and candies in the name of Rocco or Finey. Had it displayed at a major outlet like Flysh, is a good cake shop, or maybe Zumbo will put it in his window, and then we'll go around and buy them, eat them, and count them. It's easy. You just need to master shoe pastry, custard making, the spinning of sugar, and the assembly of a, of a uh, profiterole tower. Simple. I've mastered the eating of them. Yeah. Okay, so the vote goes like this. Finally, or Rowan Connolly, journalist. Because <laughs> you may as well be more nice big. All right, that's it for this week. Thanks for joining us again. We're on every Tuesday at 12pm on YouTube or 7.30pm on Channel 31. And remember, people, as Charlene sung so poignantly in that timeless mid-80s Sing ballad, it, sing this. Sing, no. Come on, Rowan, sing it, please. I've been undressed by kings and I've seen some things that a woman ain't supposed to see. But I've been to paradise and it's... Footyology. Oh, you beauty! See you next week.